So, um, good morning, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk a bit about GitHub. And um, I know that everyone here uses it. Um, that is live joining us today. Um, but like, uh, not everyone at the, at the Institute uses GitHub. Um, and this video might be helpful for both them, but also uh, us, because I would like us to, to think about maybe some features from GitHub that either we're not using uh, properly or that maybe we're not aware of. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, as if you haven't heard what GitHub is, it's this website where like you can share code, um, where you can, it's basically like a social coding platform where like and many different developers can um, participate on the same project type of thing, um, and write code, share their code, improve it, comment on the code, um, uh, modify it, um, and keep tweaking it. And you can do a lot of things like websites and many, many um, other fancy things like GitHub Actions, where you can, um, get access to free computers and run some, some checks on your code. So you can see here from the GitHub website, they say that there's like over 73 million developers across 4 million organizations and 200 million repositories. Repository is like a project they have on GitHub. Um, um, and so one such organization is the Libre Institute organization where we currently have around 250 repositories. Um, and we have around uh, 60 uh, members of the organization, plus around another 60 outside collaborators. Um, so that can give you a bit of, of the rough numbers, an idea of the rough numbers that we have. Um, and so we have this Liberty Institute organization where, um, if you view it as a public person, you'll see that it only has like 80 repositories that are fully public. Um, if you see it as, let's say myself, since I have access to all of them, you'll see that there's like 250 something repositories. Uh, as a public person, you can only see six people. That's because only six individuals or so have uh, chosen to publicly share that they belong to the Liber Institute. Um, a lot of you um, maybe don't know about that setting, um, and you might want to change it. Um, um, and then, um, uh, so, so an organization account really is like a very similar to an individual account where you can have your repositories here. We have six of them. Um, uh, some of the, I guess, GitHub recognizes them as, as popular repositories. Um, actually, all of them are repositories that I'm involved in some way here, except maybe dot dot dot. This is one. This one is from Maddie. Um, um, now, the nice thing about the Liber Institute organization account is that we're a nonprofit research institute, and as such, we were able to talk to GitHub um, and get um, free things that you would normally have to pay for. And that means that we have unlimited private repositories. We have access to quite a decent amount of like um, a large file storage or like private GitHub action workflows. Um, and so as an individual, you could pay for your own uh, professional account if you wanted to. Um, but um, I mean, the delivery is not going to pay for, for that. It's not going to reimburse you for it. So that would be like a personal decision if you want to do that. Or you can apply um, if, if you qualify as a student or as a teacher, you could, uh, you could apply for a, pro a free professional account from GitHub. Um, so some of you might be able to apply for that. Um, now, <clears throat> um, having everything under one location, I think is, would, is beneficial. I mean, you can see it within my team. Everyone in my team uses the Liber Institute GitHub account, but I think if the whole institute used it, 
it would be beneficial for everyone because then you could um, more easily um, check each other's code, like learn from their code, maybe even contribute to, to, to code from other teams um, and um, basically facilitate working together, right? Um, and so one such example here is the search bar when you're on the Libre Institute account. And so let's say like you want to use this function called aggregate across cells and you're like, well, I've never used this function. Um, maybe, you can, maybe you read the documentation for it. You see a, a simple example and you're like, I don't know, like, is that a, maybe that example is not relevant to, to what you're actually doing. Um, maybe you need to change more parameters. Maybe you would like to see an example using object names that you're more familiar with. Um, and so one, one way you could do this is um, like, let's say you're familiar with every repository, then you might know like, hey, I need to go to repository number, you know, uh, project number five, let's say, right? Look at the code directory and find these R scripts. Um, but that's, you know, only very, that, that's a very challenging thing to do, right? Um, uh, you would need to be like constantly checking code from other people, like know where things live, right? Um, so the easier way is to use the search bar where you search on the Liber Institute organization. You can do that with this org colon syntax, and then you can type the name for it. Um, and so this is one such example output where um, we can see, um, you can see over here how like um, there's search results across different categories. So one of them is the repository category. Um, and in this case, there's no aggregate across cells repository. Uh, so there's zero results there. But under code, that's the one you might be the interested in the most. That's where you can find um, uh, exact lines of code in different scripts across different repositories where that function has been named, right? Um, you can also find it uh, mentioned on commits or issues, maybe even, um, and like, we don't use wikis much. I know here, Gio uh, would like to, us, for us to use wikis more, right? Um, but you can you know, basically find results across many different categories, right? Uh, the one I would initially recommend is, you know, searching on code, right? Um, so, um, um, here you can find like an actual um, example where you can see like, oh, we're using the, this SPE object. Then we're making a data frame over here. We're called with a variable called base space, right? Um, and we're using the capital data frame function. So it, it can give you a bit of an idea of like, um, of the syntax and maybe that piece of information is more useful to you than the help file for aggregate across cells, right? So the idea is that um, if everyone uses the Libre Institute GitHub organization account, then basically GitHub becomes your kind of like your own like library or encyclopedia, right? Um, um, if you need access, um, Bill uh, can give you access. I can also give you access, but I would prefer it if you ask Bill for it <laughs> instead of me. Um, and um, because um, GitHub's um, the search results, it'll try to show you the the, um, the top results. Um, and uh, one way it does that is like it looks at how uh, recent the file was modified, right? So it's giving you, for example, in this case, the script for aggregate across cells was used more recently. Um, um, and that, in theory, could be the script where um, uses maybe the, the latest way of using the aggregate across cells function, right? Um, um, and so because of that, uh, it might be useful to, to think about others that are going to be uh, finding search results that point them to your code 
or even yourself, right? And so what would you like to have next to a function call, right? Or to a script? So one thing could be like, you could have uh, some comments, right? So you could have some documentation um, about what you're doing. Um, um, so in general, I recommend people to have like small comments, right? Um, another thing you could do is you could look at the GitHub history. So that means the, the history of how that particular file has been modified. And in that Git history for that file, you could uh, uh, write some information on the commit messages, right? So for example, you could say like, hey, I copied this script from this, uh, from this other script um, and include the path to the other script, or I mean, ideally the URL for that other script, right, uh, on GitHub. Um, um, uh, and maybe uh, some other relevant information such that like now, uh, uh, it's almost like the your your script and the GitHub history for it becomes the like ultimate documentation of of the origin of that script and the thoughts associated with making that script, which um, I think is like um, more natural than like um, um, to, to initially document what you're doing than like doing a wiki, right? Um, I think ultimately a wiki could be like a created um, version of what I talked about. Um, but I think the bare minimum is this like including some documentation and um, trying to document the things you've encountered um, that could be useful to you or others on your git commit messages, right? Um, so, um, so, um, Another potential thing would be to like, uh, like it's hard to remember where like all of the code comes from, right? So this is one example where like um, I wrote some code on this particular initial script, and Andrew edited and, and made a second script on one project. Then Abby edited on a second project. Then uh, Samia edited on the third project. So I know all of this because I've been involved in all of these projects, right? Um, and have been around long enough. But like um, keeping track of this information is going to be really challenging. Um, um, and I mean, we've had some discussions about this information could be, we could try to keep track of it like on some like type of wiki or table. Um, um, and for now, I think the minimum we could do is uh, just keep track of it um, through code comments and your uh, commit messages, right? Um, but um, it might be useful to think of having um, maybe a wiki where we link to the latest code for doing some things, right? So instead of the whole full history, maybe just the latest version of how, how we can do some particular problem, right? Um, um, cool. So, um, uh, so those are some of the slides I had um, ready because I want to talk about that on a different setting. Um, but let, let me show you a bit more of the, the GitHub account, um, the Libre Institute GitHub account. So right now we're looking at it on a, a Google Incognito. So that is um, what like um, someone that is, doesn't uh, you know, belong to the Libre Institute, what they can see, right? And so here are the five people as a public person. This is what you can see, right? Um, from the Libre Institute GitHub account. Um, there's a few repositories that are public, only a few people that are listed as public. Uh, we haven't really used some of the features from, um, from um, GitHub, such as packages or projects, right? Um, but anyway, people could use them, right? Now, uh, as a public person, you can search um, some repositories, right? You can even search some code. Um, uh, on it, um, 
So I don't know, aggregate across cells. You can search for it on this organization. Um, right now, like all the mentions of aggregate across cells that I mentioned on the other slide that are from private repositories, so you don't see anything, right? You, may, you see one issue only, um, uh, but not um, for, for that aggregate across cells is mentioned, a public issue over here. Um, but uh, not more information, right? So then you would ideally want, as a Libre East member, to be part of the organization account. And so that will involve, I guess, first knowing about it, like KJ was mentioning, and then uh, being added to it. And so uh, Bill or myself can add you to it. You need to first have a GitHub account. Um, once you join, by default, you'll be a private member. So let me search myself. Um, if you want your membership to be um, uh, known publicly, you'll have to set your organization visibility from private, which is the default, to public. Um, that way, other people will know that you belong to that organization. Um, you probably want to set like the two factor of authentication, right? Now, once you join as a member, as a regular, um, any member can create what's called a team, right? Um, we have an, the settings for like anyone can create a team. And teams are nice things because um, you might be working with a, a, a defined group of people very frequently. And so for many repositories, you might want to give that same team right access to, to, uh, to the, this, uh, a given set of repositories, right? So instead of having to always add like five different people, let's say as um, writers, of a particular repository um, and having to remember all five usernames, uh, you have a team, then you can add the team uh, and that'll be easier. Um, teams can get a bit more complicated where you can have sub teams. So for example, here, there is my team that I've created over here that has 12 members, but it has two different child teams on it. Um, um, one of them is the core, which is your people from my team. And then there's also this special LIBD JHU team, um, where um, this is a group of people that I work with a lot for some projects, right? So any, any of you uh, can create teams. Um, and um, uh, now uh, one, um, very uh, important feature um, that I want to bring up for um, discussion is whether members of the organization should have read access to all repositories. Um, I have read access to all of them, because, uh, and Bill has read access to all of them, because we're like the administrators of the account. But um, um, I think everyone should potentially have access. Um, if not, you'll, you, you'll only see the public repositories, which are those 80-something repositories, plus the ones that you've been added to as part of a team or, uh, or manually added to. Um, now, the, the challenge of doing, of giving read access to everyone on the organization means that if we look over here at the members, we'll need to make sure that uh, this list of members is um, updated um, and maintained such that like uh, anyone that leaves the institute will 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 lose um, access to all of the repositories. Uh, otherwise, we might have people with read access that, I don't know, left the institute five years ago, let's say, um, and maybe there's no reason for them to still have read access. So for example, here, Christian, um, is one such example um, who, you know, he was a student uh, in 2016, I think, um, or something like that. Um, so um, Bill is currently working through this list and trying to make sure that it's, um, uh, that is uh, uh, updated. Um, 
And that doesn't mean that someone that loses that leaves the institute loses access to their repositories. So these are former members of the institute. You can see, for example, here Andrew has access to 57 repositories. Um, and that's okay, right? Because like you want people that worked at the institute to still have access to the things they worked on, um, particularly if they are the ones answering questions about some of the code they wrote, et cetera, right? Um, so I think in order for the for us to to provide a read access for everyone, right? We'll have to update this list of members um, uh, and potentially add people that, um, that are not on the organization just yet because either they're brand new, haven't heard about it, or heard about it and were not convinced in the past to, about joining. And so um, once we do that, we'll be able to change this member privilege setting from saying no permission to then read permission, which is the, the change I would like to, to institute. Um, 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 and um, in my mind, I think everyone at the institute would be happy to share their code with everyone else, right? Um, I don't say like, hey, you should have right access to it. I just say like, you should have read access, right? Um, now, uh, if they're truly, truly like secretive projects, maybe they, um, their home won't be the Libre Institute account. Um, um, and um, that's something that to consider because as far as I know, if you get read access to all, to all members, you cannot take it away for a particular repository. But, um, um, I haven't fully tested that, I guess, because once you do this read permission, then it's hard to undo, right? Um, and that's something that I think could be helpful for everyone such that you can at least see the code from other people, right? But it also, you know, it's it's reliant on the level of trust or like um, um, you trust that other people in the Institute are not gonna take your code and like, uh, basically read a paper before you type of thing, right? On that, on that same code, right? Um, which uh, I think is something uh, we should expect, right? That like uh, that uh, people are gonna respect each other's projects, right? Um, but I don't know if like um, legally that means that uh, uh, whether like the Libre team, the, the legal team at Libre has to update maybe our contracts or stuff like that. So such a small permission setting, which I think would be great in terms of um, access for everyone, um, is not easy to, uh, to, you know, to switch, really. Um, um, cool, so, um, um, okay, so let's assume you are part of the Libre Institute account, right? Um, so now uh, you will probably be interested in learning how to search. Um, and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of information on this website on how to search, right? Um, and um, uh, one thing is, um, mm -hmm. learning about the org um, syntax, um, which is like org colon, and like in our case, Libre Institute, that's a uh, Libre Institute organization, and you can either search for it, or if you add the minus before, then it's like searching all over GitHub, except on that organization account, right? Um, so um, this is what happens if you go to the Libre Institute uh, GitHub account, then at the very top, if you search for something, uh, um, right, um, when it says over here, searching this organization, what it's really doing is just adding the or colon Liber Institute to your um, search across all of GitHub, right? That's uh, what the syntax is doing there, right? Um, now, 
Um, there are some things here that are sometimes a bit tricky to search. So you might want to use a not query. Um, now, the, if you're familiar with like GitHub, uh, sorry, Google search, um, GitHub search does not support everything uh, that Google search supports in terms of syntax, uh, but it has other things. So you, you might wanna, I mean, um, if you're looking for repositories, you might wanna search for repositories that are highly popular based on some of these metrics, um, which I don't think many of us will be doing, but you might be interested uh, on this query syntax, which is searching for things that were created or pushed before or after or in between specific dates, right? Um, so, I guess as the years go by, you might be interested in just searching like a code from, from new files, let's say, uh, based on a particular date, or um, you might need to search for things that are, uh, you know, from the past, let's say. Um, um, so I would say that overall, like the syntax is fairly um, simple from GitHub. It doesn't have a lot of powerful features. But um, 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 I think it's still pretty useful, and I think it's underused. Um, or my impression is that the uh, uh, people in my team and uh, close collaborators potentially don't use this much, right? Um, which is why I wanted to raise some awareness about it. The other thing you might be interested in is in uh, you might be interested in, for example, searching. For a particular author, right of of uh, of the commit, um, if you know who made it, um, if you're talking about issues, you can search for things that are, have been assigned to you, etc. Um, so, um, um, you know, here's again an example from aggregate across cells. This is a new ver. You know, the the slides for I made them a, a few weeks ago. Now uh, it's linking to a different file name um, because it's, uh, I mean, it's even newer than the one from the screenshot of a few days ago. This one is from seven days ago. Um, and I guess there's this other version from yesterday uh, for a different, um, a different file. And so these are relatively new function that we start to use in some projects recently. And you can start, you can start to see that it's, it's popping up more. Um, I would love it if GitHub search allowed you to search for things that like that with an open parenthesis, right? Uh, sometimes um, a particular term is uh, a word for um, a package, but also maybe a function name. So if you if you know that the syntax is something that starts with uh, a parenthesis, I would love to search for that. Um, but um, um, so far, I haven't. Uh, being able to do that. Um, and there might be other advanced features of, of the search that I'm not familiar with. Um, um, oh, I guess something that could be useful is if there's a word that it shows up in more than one uh, language. You might want to search on like R files, let's say, instead of Python files or vice versa. Um, um, and um, yeah, I think that's basically it. Um, are there other questions about this? Um, something that uh, Linda, who is not here today, and I figure out was that you could transfer a, a repository to the Libre Institute GitHub account. Um, Bill or, or I need to then give you admin powers on that repository uh, by default. Um, you only get uh, read powers, uh, write powers, sorry. Um, um, uh, which is a little bit annoying because you know that like the people transferring the repository should be the admins, right, of the repository they're transferring. And I, I tried finding an, a setting that would allow us to change that and I couldn't um, find one. So um, that's just a little bit of manual work. Um, but, um, 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 in case you have repositories outside of the Libre Institute GitHub account, um, it'll just take a little bit of effort to transfer them, uh, but it should be doable. 
Um, and hopefully we don't have any name clashes. Uh, 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 but I mean, I guess that will become more likely as we get more repositories, right? Um, yeah. Um,